What's up, knucklehead? I am Lupine Fiasco, and this is your Daily Fab Gameplay. For anyone who's new to the channel, welcome to the jungle. What we do here is review replays of games that I played on the Talishar client days or weeks ago, after enough time has passed, that I lose my bias and can more objectively judge the quality of my play. I'll talk through turn cycles and give my thoughts on the line I would take now, compared to the line I took then at the time of recording. We either learn from my mistakes or reinforce good play patterns with the overall goal of tightening and optimizing our gameplay in the future, to take down paper events like the upcoming U.S. Nationals, and most importantly, walk away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. If you would like to check out the deck I'm playing here or try it for yourself on Talishar, there is a Fabry deck link available in the video description below. While you're down there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. A YouTube subscription is the best free way to support me and to make sure that you see daily fab gameplay in your video feed five days a week. The best paid way to support me is through Patreon, and a Patreon link is also in the video description. A Patreon subscription will get you access to the DFG Discord and the shiny, shiny cardboard Talishar card back. At higher tiers, your name will appear in every DFG video. You'll get bonus DFG content every week, and there are even more benefits to come. Daily Fab gameplay will always be free five days a week, so for those who can afford to patronize me, I truly appreciate it. Now, let's talk about our sideboard and about our game plan. What we're going to do today is look at a two-parter. Um, two games played against the same Enigma, both with different results, and I want to look at both of them to show kind of where I went wrong in the first game and how we are incorporating those lessons into the second game. Uh, we do win the second game, uh, so this is less of a review of my gameplay and how I can tighten it up, though there is a little of that, and more where I am at in the Enigma matchup now and how I think KO should be approaching that. Um, action Economy wins games against Enigma. She is going to put out a lot of ward. The best Enigma lists currently, or at least what I think are the best, uh, are the decks that are playing anywhere from 12 to 18 defense reactions. Sink Below, Fate Foreseen, Unravel Aggression, Red Unmovable, Hold the Line. I've even seen that all you got popping up in lists. And the entire Enigma game plan is to stick an aura with ward. Maybe it's a spectral shield. Maybe it's uh, manifestations of mirror guide. It could be anything and just protect it. And especially if it is a spectral shield where its first attack gets discounted by Enigma's ability, it just creates a lot of value. It is a Dromite dragon on steroids where it can be very difficult for us to clear out Enigma's board and if she is allowed to keep a board and she is allowed to grow it and snowball it then we just can't clear it we lose and that is how the first game that we're going to look at goes i cannot clear enigma's board and it snowballs to the point where it is unmanageable and we get around this by having action points now that can mean rolling scab skins uh, at this point i am not on gambler's gloves in the matchup though i think it could be very good, but we are on Fiendal Spring Tunic instead of Sash, and that's because we are looking to play patiently and we're not really searching for that big pop-off turn. It can be good, but instead of playing more of a mid-rangey plan into one very big turn like we would look for with Sash, we are instead trying to send two or three chain links a turn to keep Enigma's board clear to put her on the back foot and then snowball the game uh, ourselves. And that's what we're going to see in the second game. So I play Tunic because Tunic is going to lend itself towards more of a setup style where we maybe pitch a blue for Mandible Claw. We discard an Agile Windup to make Agility and give the Claw go again. We use our Tunic to generate a second resource and attack 
with a two for six from hand. And then we arsenal the fourth card in our hand and set up for a five card turn on our next turn. And hopefully in doing so, in uh, sending three and then six and setting up a five card hand, we are stripping Enigma's hand and hopefully keeping her board clear. We're looking to do one of the two. If we strip Enigma's hand, then it is very unlikely that she can attack with anything besides a single spectral shield. And if she keeps cards but has nothing on board, then her turn is really neutered. Maybe she can attack with an aura or a miraging metamorph, but she can't do much more than that. And if we are forcing Enigma to play on rate, then we win that race. Looking at the cards we are bringing into the matchup, the only notable exclusion is Send Packing. And I cut this for the same reason that I cut it against Warrior, which is that it is so unlikely to hit that it really is not worth playing. When Send Packing is not a threat, it is just a three for six. And based on our cost curve of two cost attacks and a two cost weapon, a three cost attack really screws that up. We are bringing in yellow wild ride because action economy is so important. We are bringing in clash of agility because we want to make agility action economy is so important. Unlike prism, enigma's attacks are all either attack actions or weapons. The auras are weapons. So we can clash with a weapon. We could not clash with an ally which is why it was questionable against Prism, but is not against Enigma. Um, at the same time, we cannot pop any of Enigma's ward, so we are not adding our Clash of Might or our Smash Instinct. That's really the matchup. Enigma is going to try to build a board. She can do so with small hands or large hands, but her smaller hands are obviously worse at doing so. She can maybe do a thing every turn, which we can easily deal with if... We are not able to force blocks out of Enigma, and she keeps a large hand that can be very bad for us, which we're about to see. So without further ado, I'm going to submit tech. We'll take a look at this first game and note some big errors that I made. So first up, we have won the die roll, and I really like going first against Enigma for the same reason that I like going first against Prism, which is that we can try to keep an action point available. We can push some damage on turn zero, potentially. Enigma does not run as many non-blocks as Prism does, but she does run uh, quite a few, more than the average hero. And if we pass our turn with an action point and Enigma tries to play some ward from her hand, then we still have the ability to send damage at her to keep her from starting her first turn with ward on the board. So what we should do here in order to present some aggression, maybe push a little damage and keep an action point is actually play pulping. And the way that we play pulping here is by pitching cast bones, then run roughshod so that we are hopefully presenting six with dominate likely to deal some damage unless enigma really wants to play out her ward on defense we float two resources we potentially keep a command and conquer and then we pass the turn and if enigma plays ward then we still have our two resources to either attack with claw or attack with command and conquer and if enigma just passes the turn then we arsenal our cnc and pass it back to her we're looking to play patiently the problem with playing cast bones here as you will see, is that we don't have an action point, which lets Enigma do this. Um, Waning Vengeance, definitely not as bad as Waxing Spectre as far as a turn zero play that is going to let her snowball on her first turn. But the fact that she has any aura at all that we can't deal with is pretty bad for us. We also missed on our cast bone, so we are gonna arsenal this pulping but we are in a tough spot as far as not having guaranteed go again. Looking at an agile windup, another cast bones and a riled up on top of our deck. Um, potentially a very strong turn, especially if we're leading with pulping. It makes me think that I'm 
uh, unlikely to do any blocking here. I want to keep cards to make sure that I can go wide enough to clear out Enigma's board. I want to get this uh, Waning Vengeance off the table if possible, plus at least one Spectral Shield. Uh, Enigma might end up playing more. So we're not going to block the Spectral Shield. Um, Waning Vengeance going to come in for three. I don't know how common Uphold Tradition is going to be in Enigma, but I think we can count on it pretty regularly. Uh, absolute house in Mist Veil Limited, and really good in Constructed as well. Plus one damage, plus go again. It's just incredible. Miraging Metamorph comes down. This is a really strong card in Enigma because she is making these uh, Waning Vengeances, Shimmers of Silver, Haze Bending, where if we pop Miraging Metamorph by putting a Command and Conqueror in front of it, then Enigma gets to make another Ward 3 or another Shimmers of Silver. So Miraging presents a situation where we really can't pop it. And if we're not going to pop it, then we're not going to block it. We want to hold on to our two blues so that we can look to do something like a Pulping Mandible Claw Command and Conqueror with an Arsenal to back it up. So we'll take the 7 here and go down to 27 and fire off our pulping. We know that we can't miss on the draw discard, uh, so we are hopefully going to have a very strong turn. If this is dominated, then Enigma is going to have to give uh, a lot of resources to make sure it doesn't hit, and that means playing out word from hand. But the problem, as I've noted in the intro to this video, is just how many defense reactions Enigma is playing. So she is able to stuff the go again from the pulping, which leaves us with three cards in hand and a floating resource, but she has also protected her entire board. Uh, she still has a spectral shield and a waning vengeance, both with 1-1 one -one counter, so they have go again. And we're in a position where we don't have the action points to convert. We still have this wild ride in Arsenal. We can over pitch Cast Bones Agile Windup to play it, but it means that we probably aren't blocking very much because we don't, we won't have the cards available to then continue sending damage and continue clearing the board. Uh, Enigma playing out her Sacred Art creates two more Spectral Shields that have plus one counters. So we see that she is snowballing, and here we have another Mirage Metamorph come down. I'm gonna pack it in because at this point, yeah, there is a world where we could come back, but it is so incredibly difficult for us to stop the snowball at this point. Enigma is going to be able to block. She's playing so many defense reactions that she can play above rate. Uh, one card fours, if unravel, uh, aggression is replacing itself. It's effectively a one card five. Unmovable is going to be huge, and we are not creating the action points that we need to force enough cards out of her hand. So if she is keeping even a blue, she's sending three spectral shields and that waning vengeance. So this is an example of what not to do in the matchup, and it really starts with us skipping action points on two turns. So now we're going to jump into the second game where we're going to uh, demonstrate what to do correctly. I also wanted to give a shout out to my opponent, Howling Minds. I have run into them on Talishar previously. They, in fact, were the first person to show me what Max Nitro could do back in Bright Lights. Uh, they were the first pilot of a good Nitro Mechanoid deck. So for one thing, shout out to them for being a super solid player of new decks. For another, I just wanted to show how badly they thrashed me in the previous game before we jump into this one. So Satan, sideboard, I'm pretty confident that this is how we want to be approaching the matchup. What's interesting is that they put me going first, which is what I would have chosen anyway. Um, I am pretty confident that we want to go first against Illusionist generally, but if you know something I don't know, please tell me in the comments why KO should be choosing to go second. 
we don't have any go again in our hand. So learning from our mistake last game, we are just gonna pass the turn and give Enigma the opportunity to play out Ward, which we can then throw damage into Enigma's face and try to break the Ward. But we're gonna put that onus on her and we are gonna Arsenal Blood Rush Bellow. Maybe try to set it up on our next turn, though it seems unlikely. Uh, Rage Specter, absolute house of a card, as it does just attack for six on Enigma's turn. Uh, yep, blocking with Cast Bones, Wrecker Romp, just because we don't have that second action point without rolling scabs, I don't really want to do that. This is not the hand where I want to play Blood Rush Bellow. We would have to pitch Cast Bones to play it, and still we are in a situation where we just don't have action points. So we can block out this six, throw Command and Conquer on our turn, and just look to take cards away from Enigma. We're building up our Spring Tunic, we have a Blood Rush in Arsenal. We don't feel great about sinking so much damage, but at the same time we are setting up for a big turn where we can uh, clear out Enigma's board and take Tempo back. If you've been playing a lot of Mistvale vale Limited, you know that a lot of the time you will go low on life against Enigma while you find the damage and the chain links to clear out her board. And then once you do, you catch back up in life because it is so difficult for her to rebuild that board, or at least it can be if things are going well. So Rage Spectre coming in for seven with Go again. The hand that we're looking at here very likely one that we are just going to send Blood Rush Bellow with, not because it is a good Blood Rush Bellow hand, but because it is a bad hand for doing anything else. And if we tried to play a more patient game, maybe block this Rage Spectre with two pack uh, hunts and send Bear Fangs for hopefully eight, I think we are just continuing to fall too far behind. It is at this point time to go in my opinion, that even if we are just sending Mandible Claw Bear Fangs, that is 15 versus eight. And now we are putting Enigma in a position where she is going to have a difficult time keeping this Rage Spectre alive. At this point, getting Rage Spectre off the board is our top priority because this is just a one card eight. A one card seven currently, a one card eight uh, once it gets the Shimmer's counter. So the hand that we draw into unfortunately does not give us more than two chain links, but we are getting that uh, 15 points of damage. So we can send Mandible Claw by pitching Agile Windup. And then we can attack with a Bear Fangs, very likely pitching uh, pack hunt. Um, we could use tunic here to pay for the bear fangs. We would take an intellect penalty, but we would be guaranteed to keep a good red in our hand to arsenal. But I think just holding the tunic is going to be a better decision. Playing pack hunt instead, uh, very quickly, I want to touch on the math here because I think this is correct. If we attack with Bear Fangs and we hit our draw discard, we are sending Bear Fangs for 10, and Enigma has a potential nine block in hand to deal with it. If we attack with Pack Hunt instead, we are sending eight damage, but Enigma only has six block in hand to deal with it. So this, despite being less damage on its face, is actually presenting more damage total, a potential two instead of one. It also guarantees that we keep this Bear Fangs in Arsenal. In addition to um, action economy and making sure that we can keep cards, uh, can keep action points available, we also want to be putting high damage attacks into our arsenal. So if we arsenal maybe a runner runner or a pack hunt and draw into a swing big, if we don't have auras to clear at the time, you are going to be better off playing out your six from arsenal and saving an eight for when you do need to clear auras. And that's something that took me a minute to learn. 
Rage Spectre here coming in for eight with Go again. We'll see what Enigma's follow-up is. Uh, I chose not to block and we can talk about that decision. So we have a pulping and we are anticipating that our Enigma could have a defense reaction. And we've experienced this against Guardian as well. How do we play pulping against a class that has a ton of defense reactions? And the way we do it is by assuming that we won't have go again. So what we can do with this hand, instead of relying on pulping, we could either block, but honestly, this hand doesn't block very well. We would block for five with two blues and then send pulping by pitching a blue that is coming in for seven with conditional go again. What I would rather do instead is pitch a blue to attack with mandible claw, then discard agile windup to give it go again and make an agility for our bear fangs in arsenal, then use tunic to play pulping. And now pulping has potential dominate, but the fact that it could lose go again doesn't matter because it's the last attack on our chain. This is an interesting line. I don't know that I necessarily agree with it, although now that I'm thinking about it, we are pushing more potential damage this way. We get to attack with our bear fangs, uh, give it go again, and depending on what we draw or discard, okay, so now we can follow up the bear fangs with a pulping by using our tunic. We either discard our beast within and draw a new card, or we just pitch the beast with into Mandible Claw. So I like this line better, and I'm glad that me in the past was thinking better about these things. But in either case, whether we are discarding the windup to lead with Bear Fangs or we are going Mandible Claw Pulping, we are not leading with Pulping. That's the important thing, is that we don't want to put ourselves in a position where our pulping loses go again, because we need to get this Rage Spectre off of the table. We cannot afford to just keep taking eight damage, nine damage, 10 damage off of Enigma, keeping a single card. Leading with the pulping instead of the Mandible Claw is an interesting choice, and it is something that I had considered when I was playing out this game. And the reason not to do it is that if pulping here does get stuffed by a D-React from hand and arsenal, Enigma has no turn because she has no resource to pitch into the Rage Spectre. So this is giving us more options as far as how to continue our turn, because if we can get this Rage Spectre off the table, if Pulping keeps go again, what we would also love to do is get Shimmers of Silver off the board. Uh, Enigma, as far as I've seen, plays Haze Bending and Shimmers of Silver. I'm of the opinion that we don't need to care about Haze Bending. The value that Enigma gets from Haze Bending is less than the value that we get from just attacking her face with a Mandible Claw. Shimmers of Silver is very worth getting off of the table. Uh, for one thing, it is incremental damage on offense. The other thing to consider is how it pairs with Manifestation of Miragai, where it is worth two points of damage on offense and one point of damage on defense. Manifestations being Enigma's best card, being really her way to just end games very quickly. And that is sort of the entire reason that we need to keep Enigma's board clear. Manifestations of Miragai is effectively Arclight Sentinel if Arclight Sentinel could also attack for eight with Go again. Um, Enigma just taking the intellect penalty, passing the turn. We can think about what we want to do with this hand um, I'm okay just playing out Wild Ride over pitching Cast Bones and Wrecker Romp and keeping two resources. Just sending damage. We don't need to worry as much about action points currently because of the fact that Enigma has no board. 
quickly talking about the pulping decision here. Um, I disagree with this line, but I understand why I'm taking it. So this is working under the assumption that Enigma does not have a defense reaction in Arsenal, because if she did, she would have played it last turn on our pulping. So if we're leading with pulping, um, and Enigma doesn't have the defense reaction, that's gonna be really good for us. The issue I see is that we still have this cast bones, and I think that if we lose the draw discard, then we are in a significantly worse position for uh, only getting two cards out of Enigma and letting her keep three. I think that's how she can get back into the game. We see that she does have the unmovable, but that she did not give us a second D react from hand to take away the pulp and go again. That makes a lot of sense to me. Either she doesn't have the D react, or she is concerned that she doesn't have enough of a turn with only two cards. And with no board, that is sort of Enigma's weakness, is that she cannot put great turns together with only two cards. We still have our cast bones, we have a floating resource and two reds. Let's pitch Wild Ride to attack with Mandible Claw, present a little more damage. We'll play the cast bones, which is very likely to hit since we already have a might. And then we can arsenal our runner runner that will uh, have go again from the agility, will refresh our agility, just be a massive attack and keep that agility train rolling. Just always thinking about how do we get the most action points? How can we go as wide as possible to keep Enigma's board clear? The cast bones hits Arsenal the runner runner. In just a second, we will confirm that we have two blues on top of our deck. We have Assault and Battery and Smash Instinct. So thinking about the best way to play out this turn, we're just sending damage at Enigma's face. I don't respect Haze Bending. I might come around on that opinion, but at least for now, I don't think it is worth the time and damage it takes to kill it. So we are going to play our um, Runner Runner from Arsenal. We're going to pitch our Agile windup to do so. We currently have not discarded a card, so we could not Mandible Claw Clash of Agility, which is what I would prefer to do. What we will do instead is play Wild Ride by pitching our Run Roughshod. Um, because we have a 66% chance at having a very good card that works with Agility, we're either going to keep our Clash of Agility, or hopefully if we do discard Clash and draw a blue, it's gonna be Smash Instinct, with that Intimidate working really well with Agility. Uh, we win the draw discard lottery by discarding that blue assault and batter, so we are going to arsenal Clash of Agility um, as just setting up a five card hand with Agility. We want those big, uh, we want to go wide on our turn and we want to go tall, and a two cost six with go again is going to let us do that. Mandible Claw just sends damage at face. We are not respecting Haze Bending. Looking at uh, Enigma attempting to build up her board again, we need to go wide enough to clear the Waning Vengeance and also be able to attack Shimmers of Silver. So the way that we set that up is that we can open with Command and Conquer by pitching our blue Assault and Battery, and that CNC comes for seven, and it screws with Enigma's ability to use her defense reaction. So we are already going to force her into difficult blocking decisions. Um, potentially even getting more ward out of her hand to just try and protect whatever her arsenal is. After the CNC, we can play our E-Strike, bottoming our smash instinct and giving the e-strike go again 
then we can use our spring tunic to either pay for clash of agility or mandible claw depending on whether we've gotten this waning vengeance off the board waning vengeance is um, our primary target right now because it is the thing that can attack but if we do get waning off the board then we are looking to target shimmers of silver We get a Fade for Scene out of Enigma, uh, presumably also getting the Spectral Shield. And because we don't need to clear Ward, we can send our lower damage attack, which is Mandible Claw, and we can take the opportunity to clear out this Shimmers of Silver. Enigma just playing out another Haze Bending and Passing. Again, I'm not going to respect Haze Bending, though they are a little more dangerous in multiples. Uh, here, correctly not playing Pulping because we don't want to get stuffed by a D-React, at least not at the start. We could potentially throw a Pulping after the Wild Ride if we were ending our chain with it, but we don't want to lead with it. At this point, with no blue, we do just get to play either Clash of Agility or Swing Big. Because there is no ward to clear, we don't need to go as tall as we otherwise would. So instead of playing Swing Big for more damage, we're going to play Clash of Agility in order to still present some damage, still threaten Enigma's life total, but we're going to hold on to our tallest attack for when we need to clear ward later this game. Uh, identifying that we've played three pulpings but only two wild rides. So we still have four wild rides in the deck and I believe one copy of E-Strike. Speaking of ways to extend our combat chain. Mirage Metamorph coming for seven. Again, we do not want to pop this because we don't want to give Enigma a third Haze Bending. While I don't respect the card, I certainly don't want to donate them to my opponent. And we have the life lead here. We can afford to take some damage. So rather than just taking seven, I'm going to put my Scab Skins in front of this just to get some value out of them. Um, but we're not going to give Bone Breaker. We don't need to think about blocking with one of our two blocks from hand. What I would like to do is set up a five card hand with agility. And the way that we're gonna do that is by attacking with Mandible Claw, pitching our Mighty Wind up, then we discard Agile Wind to make Might and Agility, give the Claw go again. Then we will send Swing Big from hand by pitching Runner Runner. And the reason we are sending Swing Big rather than Runner Runner is because why wouldn't we? We already have a Swing Big in Arsenal. We don't. There is no real benefit to just keeping big attacks in the deck. We're not expecting the game to go long enough for us to reach the swing big in our pitch stack. Uh, we would rather just attack with it. Getting hold the line value here is great. We haven't drawn enough cards to turn hold the line on. We're anticipating that Enigma is going to try to transcend, um, which is fine for her it'll give her some value it gives her the chi to make a spectral shield and attack us for two but that means she isn't blocking and if she is just going to take damage from swing big to set up a spectral shield that's fine because we still have this life lead and enigma's board for the most part is clear now sacred art is a bigger deal than just something like homage to ancestors and um, rising sun setting moon. This is going to make her two spectral shields and she is going to be able to uh, potentially play out her arsenal. So this is a moment where we want to use our scowling flesh bag and we aren't using it because we think we're going to get great value. We know that Enigma has chi in her hand and can just pitch it to her hero power to make another spectral shield. The reason we are flesh bagging here is that the flesh bag is preventing two damage from the ward that's blocking, another two damage from the second spectral shield that can no longer attack, and potential more damage by denying Enigma the opportunity to play whatever's in her arsenal. We want to 
deny her these resources more than we care about trying to get fleshbag value to stop a large turn. This Enigma is running a billion defense reactions. Her plan is not to keep a large hand. Her plan is to protect these three spectral shields and just keep a blue so that she can send six damage every turn. We have agility. We have our tunic is up. We have a swing big in our arsenal. We're just going to open with bear fangs and clear out prisms, or uh, geez, Enigma's spectral shields. Again, we don't care about haze bending. Enigma is also sitting at 12 life. We are just full throttle, sending damage face, and leaving her to deal with it. Waxing Spectre comes down as damage mitigation, which is exactly what we want to see Waxing Spectre doing. And the fact that Enigma is pitching the Unravel Aggression makes me think that she doesn't have either a blue to pay for it or any way to transcend and get Chi to get the most value from it. And that is just really great news for us. And here's the cool thing with Enigma where she can do all of these neat little tricks with um, the card whose name I cannot remember, Restless Coalescence, that has four 1-1 one -one counters on it. She's going to be able to pump out some more Spectral Shields. Fortunately for us, it is a once per turn ability, so she cannot just poop out four Spectral Shields here. She is gonna be able to poop out a few though, and if she can somehow protect it, it's gonna be great news for her, but of course we know uh, that we are going to be able to go wide enough to clear out the board. Haze bending, however, getting some value, not enough value that I think we need to clear them. At this point, both haze bendings have gotten one point of value, and that is two less than every mandible claw we have sent at Enigma so far. So we need to send damage, clear out the board. It starts with a Mandible Claw. We're gonna pitch our Smash Instinct because this leaves us open to either play Run Roughshod or Swing Big, depending on how much damage we need to clear out the board. Enigma says no blocks and loses all but one Spectral Shield. This is a time where I would like to attack with Run Roughshod because even if Enigma has a three block or even a four block in hand, she cannot protect the last Spectral Shield. So we don't need to go super far over the top with Swing Big. And the second reason I hate playing Swing Big here is as good as Run Roughshod is, and as much as it is the only blue in my deck that I am actively okay with putting into my arsenal, it can really clunk the arsenal up. If we don't draw anything that discards, we have no way to play Run Rough Shot. And in fact, that is the hand we're looking at here. We have no discard, so we cannot play Run Rough Shot. And we are still gonna get to block with Clash of Agility. We're still gonna make our agility. So we're gonna be okay as far as playing out this hand, but if we could send 15 damage here with Runner Runner and Swing Big, we could arsenal our Smash Instinct to set up for a large agility turn next turn. Instead, because we can't play our Runner Runner, um, our Run Rough Shot from Arsenal, we just pitch Smash Instinct to attack with Mandible Claw. It's going to be good enough to get cards away from Enigma. But imagine if we had eight power here instead of just three, that is gonna get this spectral shield off the table. And instead, um, we do anyway, but it was Enigma's choice. Enigma just passing is kind of interesting for us. Uh, we find ourselves in a position where we have agility, so we don't need to over pitch cast bones. We can be greedy. And that means that we aren't going to discard agile lineup. For one thing, we already have the agility. For another, we can just send damage at 
Enigma. And in fact, we should have actually pitched the Agile windup here. Um, actually, no, we shouldn't have. This is smart. Okay, never mind. Because currently, yes, our wild ride has go again because of the agility. What does not have go again is our mandible claw. So when we pitch our beast within to attack with mandible claw, we will need to discard agile windup to give the claw go again. And we can use our floating resource to attack with our run rough shot. We're also making might and agility for our next turn. So yes, keeping the agile windup is very smart because if we did discard it to the wild ride effect, well then we would still have a cast bounce to play. We get two damage onto Enigma. We are sitting pretty at 19 life. We draw into a pack hunt, which when combined with agility is gonna be enough to get cards out of Enigma's hand. And we are expecting that she very likely has defense reactions. Um, we do know that she had that manifestation of Miragai. So maybe she still has a D-react in the arsenal just based on having not played a card last turn. Uh, in fact, it was unmovable, so she is going to live through the pack hunt, but we will be able to finish the game with Agile Windup for six. And that is how, at least currently, I believe KO needs to pilot into Enigma. And it isn't easy, because a lot of it is based on what we draw, and if our wild rides are shy, if we can't find agile windups to set up for big five card hands, then we aren't gonna be able to go far enough over the top to clear up Enigma's board. This Enigma did not play a Manifestations of Miragai, which is what can keep the board, either the board behind it alive or the board in front of it can protect the Miragai. But this is the strategy that I will be employing in my Enigma games going forward, which is prioritizing action points, prioritizing tall attacks in the arsenal, being able to fire off big turns on demand when I need to clear out Enigma's board, and when Enigma doesn't have a board, just sending less pressure and keeping these tools available for when I do need to pop off. So I hope you enjoyed this series of games. I hope you learned something, even just reviewing these two taught me a lot that I didn't pick up the first time. Um, and if that was your case as well, then be sure to take that like button to pound town. My comments are always open for any questions or feedback. If you haven't already done so, please consider a YouTube subscription. It's free. It helps me out. If you have some money to support me with, then I have a Patreon and a link to that Patreon is available in the video description below. Uh, whatever you do, catch me back here in a couple days for more daily fab gameplay. And until then, take care.